Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Work Dad Podcast. I'm Brian Nemhauser. You can find me uh, on YouTube at Work Dad or on Spotify or any of your favorite audio podcasting platforms as Work Dad. And then, of course, TikTok, Instagram at workdad.io because we can't be the same on every platform. That would be too easy. I am so excited to talk to our guest today, uh, Laurel Reitman. Uh, Laurel and I really got to know each other many years ago at Adobe, and it's a great example of someone making an impression on you without necessarily having it really be related to the specific work they were doing. Like, I couldn't tell you what Laurel was doing when I met her at Adobe, um, but I and I don't remember meeting her, but I remember being super impressed, uh, not only by how bright she was, uh, how quick she was to come to, I think, logical conclusions, um, but also how kind and, uh, you know, how personable she was. And often those two things don't always come together and they, they've come together in Laurel. And uh, our journey, we'll talk about a couple other things where we've crossed paths, but Laurel has had a remarkable career and has a lot to share. And Laurel, uh, I'm so glad to have you today. How are you doing? Brian, good, great. I'm really excited to be here with you uh, today and and talking with your listeners. Yeah, well, thanks for thanks for joining. Where are you joining from today? So today I'm from Seattle, Washington, having a almost sunny day. We had incredible weather uh, this weekend. I'm hoping it's going to lead to a beautiful summer, but enjoying it up here north in Seattle. Yeah, I I got out for a number of hikes the past few days to celebrate <laughs> some sunny weather. It is uh, not common for it to be in the high 60s, low 70s in uh in March. So that was that was nice. Um, well, I like I almost want to jump into some of the things that are most recent in, in going yeah. on for you. And actually, I think maybe that's a good place to start. Uh, you are not currently working, right? You've been taking a little bit of time off. Is, is that is that correct? Yeah, it's been almost a year since I had an, an official job. I like many folks in the tech industry, was impacted last February. And I, I realized I hadn't had a summer vacation since I was probably like 13 or 14. Um, I've always been a little bit of a workaholic. And so every summer, once I was old enough, it was either lifeguarding or internships or uh, jobs. And summers in Seattle are beautiful. And so I thought that that would be uh, how I would spend my summer. It turns out, little twists and turns, my mom had some health issues. And so I got to use uh, the time to help uh, her instead. She lives out in Maine, and so it was really nice to have uh, the the flexibility. Um, started to getting a little anxious near the end of this year, kind of anxious to do something, but really not excited to get back uh, to work full time. Um, one of the things I really wanted to focus on was my own health and well being. It's something I think is always taken a back burner when work has been taking place. And so I decided to focus on that um, through most of, I guess, this year, but excited to maybe, not maybe, to start some um, part-time work uh, consulting and sharing what I love about product management with uh, some companies and folks I know through my network. That's great. Well, I I sense the uh, the the almost full commitment, but the, the, the searching that goes on yeah. in these, these periods between, you know, uh, full-time employment or, or periods after, depending on how it all plays out. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, you've had a, a remarkable career and I want to kind of go through it in a second, but, but first, I don't know where you grew up. Where are you from? Oh yeah. So I grew up in West Lafayette, Indiana. My dad was a professor at Purdue and so we lived in Indiana from the time I was three till I um, graduated from high school. I came back a couple of summers before I had, um, you know, summer internships uh, to Indiana. But it was a really interesting place to grow up. Um, all Almost all the people I went to school with, their parents were affiliated with the university. So even though it was a public high school, uh, there was a ton of really interesting 
uh, students I went with, a lot of international students and, and other folks. Uh, and I even got to take some classes at Purdue when I was in high school because uh, it was right next door to, to where, where we were. So you had one parent who is a professor, you said, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Agricultural economics. Okay. And did your mother work as well? Uh, out of oh, the yes. <laughs> She's had an interesting career journey. I, she, she has her MBA, which I think is really unusual of women of her, um, her generation. And then I'm not, I don't remember exactly what she did after graduating, but she went on and was working on her master's and PhD in consumer science and retail. Um, apparently I was just talking to her the other day. She tried to do a business with painting and wallpapering, but it wasn't cutting the bills. Uh, uh -huh. my parents had gotten divorced when I was, I think, uh, sophomore year in high school, they, they separated. And so she's like, okay, I need to start paying the pills. So she went to work for city hall and human resources for a number of mm. years. And then, um, subsequent to that, she went into real estate and she was a realtor, um, in, in Indiana before she retired. And so she, she's had quite the, uh, the set of careers as she went along. I hope talking to her would help me with my career journey, but, but, um, I think some of the, the twists and turns that she faced in deciding what to do next were a lot different than what, uh, what I've been facing. Yeah. It's a very different, yeah, I, I am very eager to get into that part of the conversation with you. Um, but it sounds like you came from a house where there is a lot of achievement, a lot of academics. Uh, is that is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, I think so. And I certainly um, was a high achiever through through high school. I've always been good at math and science. So my undergraduate de degree is in electrical engineering. Um, and I thought about going Purdue, but it was right around the corner and I really needed to get um, mm -hmm. away from home. But I've always liked math and science. I think. Um, I think I won every single math award there was to have uh, in high school. I was just looking back the other day. I think I was lucky I had a, a junior high female math teacher. And I think that was really important because she encouraged me um, to stick with it. Because I know there certainly want, weren't a lot of girls doing math and science uh, when I was growing up. I also got to go to like a SWE summer camp uh, for a couple of weeks as Society of Women Engineers. Um, so I definitely had a lot of... I wouldn't say pressure, but encouragement um, from my parents to to study and and do well in school. And I think some of that's what led me. I went to Yale for my um, undergrad and had an opportunity to to meet all sorts of really interesting uh, folks there as well. Was that a big culture shock from Indiana going to Yale? Not really. Um, I you know we had a, I was born on the East Coast. My dad. Um, was I think some of his initial he had like a post grad work out there he had gone to to MIT for his uh, undergrad and um, graduate studies and we had family back east and had uh, in like the Virginia area and so you know we had been out there a lot and you know the thing about it is there are so many kids that come from so many different places and almost everyone one of my roommates was from Bermuda. Um, and so it wasn't so much a culture shift. It, for me, it was really fun because I think it was one of the first times I wasn't different because I was smart. Um, I was different in Laurel because of the things I did and I was good at. And so it was just really fun to be around a bunch of people who were passionate about what they did, um, excited about learning um, and you know, getting away from home uh, for college can be a lot of fun. That's a wonderful observation the 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 statement that you weren't different because you were smart and to to kind of realize that at that age i think is is powerful one of the things that i think can happen at college that that yeah. you know is it's such a such a treat but you know i i distinctly remember when i started my professional career realizing like oh my god everybody here is incredibly talented and smart and then when hiring, you realize there's a lot of that. And so it's really the texture of the person yeah. that really makes or breaks a lot of it rather than a specific academic, other than maybe in some like higher level sciences and and specific like, you know, in Adobe, like photography, you yeah. know, digital experts in that way is, is special. But I think that's a really uh, astute observation. 
I mean, um, I, I, feel, yeah. I feel like at a lot of the universities you go to, you just meet people in your major. And like my major happened mm -hmm. to be really small. We only graduated with like 11 folks uh, wow. in the class. Yeah. It, and I was the only girl that made it through. We had a couple uh, freshman year, but uh, electrical engineering isn't the easiest uh major to, to no. make my way through. But it meant that all my friends were in, you know, psychology or economics or um, physics or biology. And so, you know, our conversations weren't centered around engineering problem sets. They were all the other uh, things that we got to do uh, together. So you, we didn't know at the time, or you didn't know at the time, yeah. um, that you'd go on to have this career that had you eventually be in, you know, a senior like an executive general manager at microsoft and and doing like remarkable things what do you feel like compelled you uh, to this you know uh, level of achievement that you ended up um uh, accomplishing was it was it internal was it intrinsic w were you feeling pressure at all from where you brought up or was this something that you just kind of were drawn to I will say I don't have a good answer for that one yet. It's something I've actually been trying to unpack with uh, with some of my therapists over the years because I think some of it I think probably comes from the environment. You know, it's not mm -hmm. that my parents were like, "No, you need to." I mean, I don't. Thinking back, I don't remember at all them saying, "Oh, you need to be the best." Or, but I think they always encouraged me to to push and strive and and work hard. Uh, so I, I think some of it also so a lot of it is intrinsic i do also and this is probably um intrinsic more than environmental like i like to surprise people prove them wrong you know push hard and so i think there's an element of i mean i like doing really hard things one of the things i like to do for fun is triathlons and one of my goals part of the reason i want to focus on health and fitness is i'd still like to do a half iron man i haven't knocked that off yet and you talk to people and I'm like, oh, that's really hard. And I'm like, no, I mean, yes, maybe. But I I like, I think there's just something intrinsic where I like taking really hard problems and figuring out how to solve them, whether it's on the career journey, whether it's problems at work, whether it's, you know, athletic um, achievement, you know, there's just something inherent where I like to see hard problems and then feel the success on the other side of knowing that I've accomplish that, uh, through, through effort and blood, sweat and tears. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so high level, um, I'm not going to get into all the different yeah. stops, but you started your career at Microsoft. Um, you know, you were summer intern at Hewlett Packard, uh, yes. but, but, um, you were what was at that time called a program manager at Microsoft. And, uh, we should talk about that a little bit because I think program manager at Microsoft is pretty similar to product manager most yeah. places. Um, and you worked in <clears throat> like the MSN <laughs> search yeah. back in the day and ended up being, you know, growing to be, you were there for seven years. You were the lead program manager for Internet Explorer, you know, back when that browser was going and um, and then ended up at Adobe where I met you and uh, worked in the platform business unit and on Flash Media Server, and then ended up being a VP at Joyent, um, which I don't know much about Joyent, so maybe yeah. we chat about yeah. that a little bit. Then you were at DocuSign for four years, so you've been to a number of different companies. You you rose to be a VP of product management at DocuSign, and then you went back to Microsoft and uh, ended up being uh, a general manager for uh uh, Dynamics 365, an HR product, and eventually a, a partner, director of product management for gaming um, yes. in, in the Xbox store. So a, a really remarkable journey and across a lot of different companies, and you kind of came full circle and boomeranged back to Microsoft. Um, how how do you feel that, that your start of your career shaped where you ended up? Like, what were the... What were the things that you didn't have when you started that you quickly started to realize were, were things that either you liked or that you wanted to do? Well, I think 
so I, I ended up at Microsoft and I think you had mentioned their program management discipline really was a blend of program and product. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think I've, I've learned over the course of my career, the product stuff is what I love the most, but really any good product manager actually needs to be pretty good at uh, program management as well. It's, it's kind of a blend of the two, but I think I I had done my undergrad in EE. I'd um, done a couple of internships at Hewlett Packard. The first one was on uh, test development engineering of integrated circuits. The second one was R and D at digital cameras. And you know I had done my senior project with um, Lego Mindstorms, which was super fun. And then I had interviewed for a job. I think it was at IBM with integrated circuit stuff because that's a, a lot of where the um, faculty was working and I was like, I don't want to be in front of a computer like I like people. Uh, and so the Microsoft job seemed really fun. I think one of the women who I had met during interning was telling me a little bit about the program management role at Microsoft. And, you know, I interviewed, I was lucky enough to to get hired. And also our, our family um, has a place in Maine. And if you've ever been to Maine, particularly kind of the Acadia National Park area in Seattle, they feel very similar. Like mm -hmm. I love the trees, um, the outdoors. And so there was just something about coming out to Seattle that I was like, oh, this seems like a really wonderful place uh, to live. And, you know, but, and what I loved about Microsoft um, is they did a ton of college hiring. And so they really focused on bringing people in who knew really nothing, right? Like in college, you learn, I, I think the most important thing to learn in college is learn how to learn, um, learn how you go through the process of learning something new and different. Because in any career, you're going to have to learn something new. And so how do you go about building that muscle? But it meant they had really good training, they had good mentorship, they had good managers. And so, you know, the, the opportunities that I was given to do things that um, I don't know that I thought any I had any business doing, you know, I ended up doing our database design, which I was like, why are you having this like one wow. or two year out of college kid doing this? But it was fun. I got to go and take some training on SQL Server. And and, and so I, I think what I really appreciated that uh, as a first job out of school was such a focus on helping me learn, helping me develop uh, the amount of opportunities uh, that I got. You know, I what I loved about the company and I think one of the things that that allowed me or I was excited to come back about was um, there's so many different teams. And so when I moved from MSN Search to Passport to Internet Explorer, you're still in the company, so you don't have to re-sign up for benefits or get a new email address, but it's a brand new product with brand new challenges and brand new people. Um, and there's a lot of encouragement of letting people move internally for, for those opportunities. And so I think, you know, for me, it was, really nice to be in an environment where I had a lot of support. I had a lot of um, encouragement and really good structured training on, you know, art of negotiation or mm. um, basics of, of program management. And because it was such a, a large company, there's a lot of structure, which I think helped with, with learning so early in my career. Yeah. I think some, some people don't, recognize that aspect of larger companies is it's it's not necessarily university but there's a little bit of that um there's enough security that you have a, and resources available that you can take advantage and learn if you're interested in doing that and and kind of sprout into different directions you, you said that you were the only woman who you know grad was in your graduating class for your, your specific uh, major. degree major um you know, what was it like as a as a woman in tech back when you started? This would have been like 1998, 99. Yeah. Uh, you know, in program management in particular. I, I, I guess I. Looking back, I'm not sure if I remember it. Mm. I, I remember definitely later points in my career, like at um, Joint, even at DocuSign, at um, a little bit at, 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 I mean, I think along the way, there are numerous times I'm the only woman um, in the room. And mm -hmm. I think in particular, the expectations of how you behave and how you show up, I think women are trained to be nice and friendly. I mean, that's 
I, I do think I'm kind and nice, but also I think that there's some of like, that's how um, you show up. And and that became particularly harder in my, in my career where as a leader, while that's important, being a lot more assertive and um, being in the one in charge and finding the right balance of that, I think is, is, is really, um, is really hard. You know, I know that there are numerous times I was the only woman in the room. Um, I mean, e even in my career to, to kind of, to this point. Um, and I definitely, like, I, I, I know I have proof and in, in data points of having to work harder. I mean, that's maybe to your point of like challenge mm -hmm. and achievement. It's like, I know I have to work harder uh, to achieve a lot of the same uh, success that some of my my male colleagues do. I think it was the first time I didn't feel like I was treated differently was actually at DocuSign with hmm. my engineering partners. Um, and I don't know how much of it was them versus me, but I, when I first joined DocuSign, I came in as the director for our APIs and our, our developer experiences. And uh, the the folks I had the opportunity to work with were just well, you're just Laurel and you're just good at your job. And, you know, a lot of them still remain kind of close friends uh, to this day. But I think it was the first time I felt like, oh, no one is thinking I'm not as good or thinking I'm not as talented. I mean, in particular, I have a very technical background in so many of the mm -hmm. things that I've done. And I don't think that that's something people expect of women very often. Like, oh, maybe you're great at user experience or uh, some of the other sides of things. But the fact that oftentimes I'm as much or more technical than than many of my male colleagues, you know, it it takes a while to sort of prove that um, and have people recognize it. Um, I know it at at DocuSign when I got or before I got promoted to VP, my um, boss, all of my other peers were VPs except for me, and <laughs> I went in and I was like, hey. You know, I'd like to talk about this. What do what do I need to do in order to get promoted? And we had an offsite, and each of us had written a strategy paper. And mine was way better <laughs> than, than everyone else's. And shortly thereafter, my boss came back and was like, "Okay, we're gonna get uh, working on this." But you know, it's not that the, that the guys I work was working with weren't talented as well. But I think it's it sometimes it takes an extra push or a sponsor or a mentor or someone to um, to have access to some of the same uh, same opportunities. Is that something that, when did you pick that up? Or uh, maybe I should ask first, is that something that you now just bake in when you're in a job that you're gonna have to advocate for your compensation and title uh, more than maybe uh, a man would? And, and so that's top of mind for you or? It definitely is now. I think, def you know, since, um, well, in, in the startup I was at, I think there was definitely a lot of sexism um, mm. there that bo both myself and some of my other uh, female colleagues um, faced. I, I think some of it is less about knowing I have to fight for it and looking for people to work with where it's not going to be um, an issue. An issue, like, mm -hmm. or less of less of an issue. I think. You know, the biggest lesson that I've learned over my career is that the most important thing about a job is the people. Um, who are you going to work with and who, who you're going to work for? Um, you know, man or woman, it doesn't matter. You know, that really impacts your day to day. It impacts, um, you know, when I've worked for great managers, I've had the most success in my career uh, because I have the less least anxiety or stress about how am I doing and what's going to look like. And when I'm fearful around how I'm going to do, or I feel like I'm having to fight um, politics or people, um, I, I don't succeed as well. Um, it's just it's it, you're spending energy in other places, and so I, I think there's an element of like I have to keep that in the back of my mind, um, but also let me choose who I'm working with. You know, I've interviewed for jobs where I, I just didn't get a great vibe off of of the folks I'd be working with or for. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to pass. Like, it's just not worth um, the time or energy because, you know, I'm not going to be as successful as I as I can be there. Was there a point in your career where you realized how good you were? And... I still don't think I do. 
Okay, that's what I'm. <laughs> uh, we should talk about that. I, I'm asking because there was definitely a point for me where I, I realized, like, I'm pretty valuable. There's not a lot of people, and that's. Not, it sounds incredibly yeah. egotistical to say, but you kind of look around like there's a lot of people not doing the bare minimum or just doing, but if you're actually, you know, really care about what you're doing and you're delivering results and you're hiring good talent, all this kind of stuff, that's not easy. And I, it's certainly not easy to hire somebody and find somebody like that. And you are someone from the outside, obviously yeah. I, I have a, a ton of respect for. So once you have that kind of internalized, like I have this value, it does change the dynamic of your working relationship with your employer. And I'm just curious I, if it, it sounds like maybe that hasn't been something that you've- No, I, it thought. has. I joke. I, you know, I think it, it's actually a reset uh, or, or it happens in reset. Like I'll get into a new job and I'll have imposter syndrome around um, that opportunity. Sure. Certainly the, the, the GM job at Microsoft, I was like, wait, they want me to be a general manager. And and then by the time I left that job, I'm like, oh, I'm good at this. I I have the skills and capabilities. I've got a great team. Um, you know, my team can can handle what I'm doing. But I think a lot of times when you move into a new role, especially if you're moving into a role that's maybe bigger or more challenging than what you've done before, I don't think I've met a single person who hasn't had some imposter sure. syndrome Absolutely. when they get into that. And then once you get into it and you see the success, I mean, certainly, you know, by the time I left DocuSign, I was like, yeah, I'm, I know I'm great at this. I was managing, you know, global teams. Um, I I had gotten promoted. I won their signature award one year, um, which is like a, which they didn't normally give to VPs, but they're like, but Laurel's so great. Um, and, and I think at each turn of the crank, it's sort of the, I'd gotten to the place where I felt like, yes, I'm good at this. And then that's when I started to get itchy to do something new and put myself um, in, into an uncomfortable situation again. But I, but I do think now, you know, at the place I'm at, I know I have value. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm interested in kind of doing some consulting is I know I have value. I know I can bring value to, to companies and teams and people. And, but how can I do it on my terms mm -hmm. so that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I maintain the the balance and the um, the the time for me and the time uh, for me kind of giving to others as in a balance that works for me. Yeah. Well, one of the other pieces I was uh, you've had the experience of kind of going from some entry level. It's not the most entry level position uh, at program manager, but you had a, a starting position and then you've moved into executive roles and you've yeah. moved more and more senior. <clears throat> um, a lot of people don't know what that feels like and, and specifically that there's an escalating um, expectation of certain aspects of your work. And there's other parts that don't really change as much as people perceive them to be. So uh, now that you've kind of gotten to maybe, maybe not the top of the mountain, yeah. uh, depending on what your perspective is, but you've got very high up. What were the parts of moving up in an organization that surprised you? Um, what of the parts of moving up in an organization did you like or not like? I, I think... I was talking with someone about this the other day who she's a recent uh, M2. And so we were talking uh, manager of managers. And so we were talking about, you know, what's new and different around that. And I, I think as you get more senior in the organization, there's more of a need to manage up and out. I think when mm -hmm. you're an individual contributor, you have a relationship with your peers and your boss and si sometimes sister teams, but your boss or other people in the organization are the ones responsible for the politics and understanding, you know, budgets and priorities and, you know, what's what's actually um, kind of some of that landscape. And when you're and so as you move up, you need to become more aware of who holds the power. Um, and it's not, you know, that's part of what I find fun is it's oftentimes not who's at the peak of the org chart. It's who's actually working on the important projects or who's going to be a good ally or who's not going to be a good ally. And how do you figure out what their priorities are and and work around that? And then, you know, I think for me, one of the things I really had to work on, there was part of that move from director to, to um 
VP at DocuSign is executive presence. Like, how do you show up in a room? Do you come with credibility? You know, how do you um, keep your emotions in check? The anger, the tears. I mean, I'll, I'll admit I cried at work. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and that's not something women really are allowed to do. So I'm like, okay, how do I keep this in line? If I'm upset, how do I go, you know, pull myself together and then then come back into the conversation. But the executive presence, I think, was a big thing. Um, and realizing, especially, I think you and I had talked about this in a different context, that you're a role model. Like what you do, people you don't even know see and matters. And so, you know, thinking about the fact that how you show up, the decisions that you make, um, how you treat people, reflects on on you and your organization. And then I think the other is, especially as you become a manager, that um, you're no longer just responsible for your career. Like, I think one of the greatest privileges as a manager is how do you grow and mentor the people who who work for you? And, you know, I've been lucky enough in a couple of jobs that I've built great teams to the point that it's not that they didn't need me, but they were fine. Um, without me because you know they'd had continued to grow and develop and i think that's realizing um you know especially as a manager of manager like your job is to work through people um not to do the work and i think figuring out what is your job like where do you add unique value um you know where do you have a unique perspective i think uh you know if I think about Satya versus some of the other CEOs at Microsoft, um, he asks great questions. And I think a lot of where Microsoft changed its culture was leaders no longer yelling. Some some were still yellers, but a lot of it was how do you just ask good questions? Because with experience comes perspective, which means mm -hmm. you can ask better questions of, of folks and use that to say, okay, how can I help them um, come to the conclusion? Because it's so much easier to give advice. It's really hard, but more impactful if you can just ask uh, good questions and let the folks on your team or the folks you're working with uh, figure things out. <laughs> I'm laughing because uh, I have a reputation of asking a lot of questions of, of my <laughs> team. <laughs> they, they, they love and hate it. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I can understand and, and respect that. And uh, I'm curious, one of the things that, that I think I've observed in moving up and it depends on the organization, it depends on a lot of factors is, uh, you're a product manager. So yeah. part of what, like what makes or breaks a product manager is what they say no to, right? It, it is easy to pri like to say, yes, that's a great, idea. like, let's chase after this, but there's precious few, you know, days and hours and, and resources. So you have to prioritize, but as you get to be an exec saying no to things is not necessarily an option, um, in all cases, or yeah. at least it's a different type of no than in product management. So I'm curious if you experienced that kind of duality of, of what it means to be good at the job. Yeah. I, I, but I think it's it's you may not be able to say no, but you there is still in um, limited time and resources, mm -hmm. and so you're saying no to something else. Like as a as an executive and certainly as a leader, like one of the last projects I was working on at at Xbox, it's like, well, we need to figure out how we're going to drive revenue and how are we going to grow revenue um, by a number that was probably unachievable given mm -hmm. you know people are going back to work they weren't playing as many video games the folks who were building um video games had all gotten impacted by the pandemic and so it was okay yes we have to figure out how to drive towards this number it means we have to pick other things that we're not doing it also means we need to ruthlessly prioritize which projects we're going to deliver for which ones are going to have the highest ROI or highest, highest chance of success. And, and yes, there are also opportunities in, as an executive where you can ask for more resources or um, more money. And so figuring out, you know, when do you have a strong enough business case uh, in order to do that? So I, I think you, you still have to, maybe you say yes to the project that you have to get done, but then you need to be transparent about, well, it means these other things aren't gonna get done um, instead. 
because otherwise you're going to burn out your team or um, you're not just not going to deliver those other projects and then someone else is going to be disappointed. Uh, I, I almost think you have more power as an executive to say yes and no in parts because you've better perspective. Like I think mm -hmm. it's really like one of the the advantages as you get higher in the organization and and things that can weigh on you too is you just have better perspective. Like at a small startup, you know how much money is left and what the risks and rewards of doing a deal or um, you know saying yes or no to a project are. Um, but it means you have insight into well, what does the sales team actually care about and the marketing team and how is our business doing? And and with that insight, I think it makes it easier to make smart decisions where sometimes if you're really far into the organization, you don't have as much visibility. And so you just do what you're told, but but you don't have the ability to, to push back in the right ways because you just don't have the data. I was not a good math student, but unlike you, but something I do obviously remember from math is the concept of showing your work. Right. Mm. There is in order to get the question right, you couldn't just get the answer. You had to show your process for getting to the answer. And it sounds like what you're saying and something I've experienced as well is. No, especially at the most senior levels of, of an organization. Is off. It's, it's very rarely as black and white as yes or no. no. Right. It, it is. Here are the options we've considered. We could do it this fast. We could add these more people. We could, re you know, reduce over here. We could trade this thing off. Here's why we decided this is of these three options is the one that we like best. And by showing your work, then that gives you a chance to have a more nuanced conversation with other execs and, you know, yeah. you know your boss uh, you know, at the C level, as it may be. And it, it, it sounds like that kind of approach from you. Yeah. It, it and I think, you know, most of the time it's like, here's my answer. At least the executives I, I was working yes. with at Microsoft, they always wanted to know like, okay, well, what's your recommendation? And then, okay, what else did you consider? Why? It, and it depends from, from leader to leader. But most of the times I feel like um, what was hard for me uh, it, and fun and challenging at the same time is the more senior you get, the more you're expected to just make those decisions. Um, but it means you're accountable for the consequences. So if it goes well, great. If it doesn't, it's your butt on the line. Uh, so it's kind of scary, but um, it's also empowering because then you, you know, it's on you to, um, to to make those decisions. But but I think, you know, most of the decisions at a company like Microsoft in particular are based on well, what's it going to mean for the bottom line? You know, what are our strategic priorities? And so if you're sh if you are showing your work effectively and can explain how what you're doing um, ladders up it, you know, it's like, OK, that seems like the right thing to do. Or they'll come back with more questions or um, clarity. Like this is one of the things I, I liked about the newer Microsoft is you didn't get yelled at. You got questions. People wanted to understand, you know, why did you come to that conclusion? But it wasn't this emotional um tirade about um well i want this or i want that it, it was sort of like okay well what's right for the business how does it fit in with our strategic priorities what does it mean for our customers um and then well that's the, it sort of is like well then the the answer becomes obvious um in most situations yeah, I, I'm imagining, uh, and forgive the visual here, like a sweaty Steve Bomber pounding the table, trying to tell you by force of will that this is this will happen and just get it done versus, you know, maybe a more intellectual, not that Steve's not an intellectual, but but like a more Socratic kind of uh, experience of asking questions of how you got there. I, I, I have observed in the in the questioning environment because I've seen that as well that it, it can be disingenuous and there's a little bit more of an insidious thing depending on who's involved where the questions aren't really being asked because they want to know the answer the questions are being asked because they're trying to make you look bad and they're trying to find weaknesses in your argument and I personally got really tired of that that was something that wore on yeah. me from a senior leadership perspective like why aren't we all just trying to figure out the thing that's the best as opposed to 
you're seeing this as a threat. If, if I get sort of support for this, it's a threat to your plan. And so you're trying to find ways to ask just the right question that makes someone else doubt my plan. And uh, I, that, I found that very frustrating. I, I certainly found a lot of, so if I think about all the companies I've worked at, they have very different cultures. Like Adobe was very passive aggressive. And yeah. I think <laughs> there, there was a lot more of the like people trying to be nice but maybe weren't actually being nice. Whereas I think Microsoft, because it had this bite growing up, there was less, um, I'm gonna be nice to you, but not really nice. Like most mm -hmm. of the time people were either nice to you or not. And the people who are nice or, or kind of working with you were, um, were generally not backstabbing. I, you know, I think, I think at any large company and as human beings, we're always looking to protect ourselves. And so I think there is an element of who do I actually trust? Are their priorities aligned with mine that you have you have to pay attention to to make sure you're allying, allying with the right folks that you understand um, where you stand. And then there are consequences when you you don't. But you know, I at least felt that for the most part people were genuine um, and and generally were interested in the success of the business. Now they would get angry if you weren't carrying your weight and uh and it meant the whole you know business unit wasn't doing as well as as maybe they would have liked. But I think there's a lot more focus on like how do we grow the business and and how does how does how does what you're doing contribute um to that. I want to talk a little bit about the tail end of your time at Microsoft. Yeah. And this is when you and I happened to to kind of come back into uh, talking to each other. And before we get to the, to kind of some of the pieces, I think that when I reached out to you was uh, you were you doing the Xbox st stuff and you were your dad had been um diagnosed with with i think this has already happened am i remembering the timeline correctly i, I believe so because i know my dad had gotten diagnosed it was in a couple I years it, ago i think it was in like 2019 and then had gone through one round of treatment and then got better and then uh it, it came back and it was around the time that it came back that i actually moved roles um within Microsoft. And and one of the reasons I think I was excited, I mean, one, I was excited about the job because I like video games. And <laughs> I was like, this is gonna be really fun. Uh, but also Microsoft is a company that has good uh, family leave policies. And so, you know, I, I knew being at a company like Microsoft that had the infrastructure and support was going to be a better fit for me than um, like a small startup where, uh, I wasn't going to be able to um, take time off or have the flexibility uh, that I. Let me make I sure I understand. Maybe. Sorry to interrupt. Let me make yeah. sure I understand the sequence. So, so you had been the general manager job at Microsoft, and then, then you got this relapse news about your dad and and his health, and moved into this other job, um, kind of uh, in relation sort of to it. That? Not entirely. So my 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 general manager job um, during the pandemic it got eliminated. I see. Uh, and so I um, I've gotten laid off in my career three times. Well, almost almost laid off uh, three times in my career. Once at Adobe, uh, and then twice at Microsoft. Um, and uh, so my my dad had gotten diagnosed when I was the general manager, and I had uh, taken some leave when he had a, a surgery um, to help. He had uh, bile duct cancer. And so he had to have a Whipple procedure, which is this like they go and reorganize all of your GI and it's a pretty major surgery. I think he was in the hospital for like a week um, mm. plus recovering. So I took some time off. Um, he had the surgery at um, Hopkins. And so, you know, I, I was able to use the family caregiver leave to just like peace out for two weeks. And then he was, um, had gotten kind of better and there was no evidence of disease. And then in the middle of the pandemic, uh, it came back. And at sort of the same time during the middle of the pandemic, 
I lost uh, my my role at, at Microsoft was eliminated. And so I started interviewing for all sorts of jobs. I was looking at other jobs in Microsoft. I was you know, working with uh, exec recruiters um, at small companies. And you know, fortunately, the role I wanted to stay at Microsoft at, at that time. And so fortunately, the role at Microsoft um, worked out. But one of the things that that really made me want to stay at Microsoft and look so hard for another a role or opportunity there was the fact that I knew, uh, you know, we had these caregiver leave policies, you know, I'd have a good team and people who could help um, provide some infrastructure and support versus if I was a CPO at a small startup, like, I was like, I don't know how I'd be able to step away um, from that job. And then I think it was after that job search, uh, when I was in the Xbox role, you and I um, reconnected. Got it. That, thank you for connecting those dots. So, your dad's battling a serious illness. You're in a new job. Um, I reach out to you on LinkedIn. We haven't talked for probably 10 years. I don't 10 know. Years, it's, been yeah. a, it's been a long time. And I don't even remember what our interaction was. But what I do remember is that you ended up connecting me with three recruiters that you had been working with that had reached out to you. And one of those recruiters was someone who ended up connecting me to Propel, which is a company that I ended up working for for the last couple yeah. of years. And so indirectly, you know, led to me finding my next role. And this came during a time where it was the first time I'd really been really officially looking for a job in a long time and was really surprised by how many by who ended up helping me and who didn't. And it was often not the people that I expected that were actually generous with their time and generous with their assistance. And so I'm curious, I mean, like I said, you're you're dealing with a lot yourself in this moment. Why did you take the time um, to re even respond, let alone to, to, to help in that situation? I guess I, I like helping people. I mean, part of that's, I think, building products is about uh, helping people. But but one of my real passions is mentoring, coaching, and helping. And I I also know how hard it is to find a, a job. I mean, I, I had gone through it. Um, and I know it, at more senior levels, it's particularly uh, difficult. And so I every chance I get to help someone in my network who I've worked with, who I know is good, you know, it's not like it it takes a lot of my time. I think you and I probably talked on the phone for an hour. I probably sent three emails. Um, one of the recruiters did reach out to me to say, hey, you know, Brian's never worked for a small company before. Do you think mm -hmm. you've it? And I was like, yes, of course. Um, so, you know, it's what, an hour or two um, investment of of my time, but I, I know it'll, or I hope um, it'll be impactful. Um, I hope, you know, when, I, and I, I know a lot of people have been generous with their time with me. Like when I went through my job search, I probably talked to like 50, 60 people um, and, you know, getting their perspective on, well, what do you want to do? And can I connect you to someone? You know, I I just think it's it's a small thing I can do, but I I I hope it will have an impact and help someone else. I mean, that's. Um, I recently met someone through I part of my severance most recent severance package was outplacement services. So I'd been going to webinars and learning about various topics. And on one of them, there was a guy in the chat or had asked a question who'd been in real estate and wanted to move into product management. And so I just messaged him and was like, hey, you know, I've been in product management for 25 years. If you just want to talk, like let me know. Because I, I also know how hard it is to get into product management if you don't have a CS background or an MBA. And so hopefully, you know, an hour of my time um, can help him figure out what he wants to do. And I don't know, I just, I, I enjoy, um, you know, taking what I've been given and figuring out how can I give it um, back to other people. I think that's one of the reasons that I was like, I don't want to stop working completely is I I enjoy um, kind of helping people, um, you know, at work with products, with 
their careers. Um, it's just something that fills my tank. I mean, I think we all have tanks. And for me, helping people in that capacity fills my tank. Well, I certainly uh, am very grateful for it. And also, you know, I get a ton of people reaching out on LinkedIn. And I'll admit, I, I, a lot of them I don't have time to respond to, or even if I do, I don't choose that that's the place I spend time and deciding which of the dozens I'm going to actually respond to or not. And I can only imagine in your situation, you've got probably more than I do. So I, I think it's, it, it, it's, it's remarkable that, you know, you chose to, to spend that time and, and certainly appreciate it. And with the job I was able to get, I was able to hire multiple people that are doing great work and having real impact and having impact on other people. So I absolutely believe that it it has a, a real um, ongoing um, value. And so I think that says a lot about you. I also just know that because you and I were talking about this a little yeah. bit ahead of the show, you know, your job ended at Microsoft. You've been taking this time for a year. Your mom then had some health issues. You've yeah. been dealing with that. But somewhat implicit in this is that, look, when you start your career, um, there's an imbalance between an employer and an employee in terms of what they need from you and what you need from them. Yeah. Like you need the money to like to pay the bills to, you know, whatever your achievements determined by a lot of things there, your, your self-identity your um, self-esteem can be a lot related to that. But there's a point in where you've gotten enough achievement, maybe you've gotten enough financial comfort or, or independence that there's a little bit more of an equilibrium there. And that change is not only your ch power of choice of what you do, but now you're, it's almost uh, overwhelming. It, it might oh, yeah. be the right word for the amount of choice and how do you choose what you do next? And do you want to do what you've been doing all this time? Is that a, a fair way to describe what you've been experiencing? Definitely. I mean, I think there was an element of that, the last job change um, where I, you know, because, because of the success that I've had in my career, uh, because of the talent that I have, I had so many different opportunities and it was, do I want to be at this cool startup with like incredible people or do I want to be at Microsoft or do I want to go to Google or Amazon or Salesforce or so many choices. And it was super overwhelming. And so, you know, to some extent I took the um, easy choice of like, oh my gosh, I get to work on Xbox and stay at Microsoft. Like that seems great. Um, this last year has been hard because you know, we, we're lucky to be in a financial position where I don't have to run back to work. I think, you know, I really feel for the people with the layoffs, either who are here on visas and either have to get a job or move or or people who are earlier in their career. You know, I'm I'm lucky to be in a financial position where, um, you know, I don't have to jump into to something, but it means I don't have to jump into something. Mm -hmm. And so uh, figuring out what do you really love and what do you really want to do is hard. Um, and, you know, every time I come back to it, I do really like product management. I really like helping people. I really like, you know, coaching and mentoring people. I still stay in touch with the folks who are my direct reports at the last job and uh, chat with them on a regular basis to help them with their, their um, career decisions and crossroads. And it is hard because if you have the ability to do anything you want to do, it means you have to actually figure out what that is. So mm -hmm. for me, uh, the, I decided the number one priority is I want to work on my health and fitness um, because if I do that now, it's a long-term um, dividend. Last summer, I did the Seafair triathlon, um, but I still didn't have the kind of health improvement results I was looking for. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go go harder. I have a personal trainer, dietitian, kind of all this stuff. To help focus on that. Um, gonna hire a triathlon coach so I can actually get wow. to um not this summer half iron man, but I'm like, I still have that on my bucket list. So that's my sort of number one priority. But then um and having time to meet with my friends. I've rediscovered a love of reading. I like fiction though. <laughs> I've tried with business books, uh haven't had a lot <laughs> of success. Um but I I forgot how much I enjoyed um 
reading. So I've been doing a ton of that. And then I realized though that I do like the work and and at least in the discovery so far, I there's a reason I kept doing product management for as long as I did. I like it, I enjoy it. Um, but I also know that to do the job the way that I like to do, um, if I were to take a full-time role, it would be you know, 40, 50, 60 hours because I can't do things um, part way. So I'm like, okay, this is great. I can do something part time, see how that feels, see how that works. Who knows if it'll be successful or not. But I think one of the best pieces of advice I think I've gotten through a lot of these um, like career seminars and other stuff is we'll just try it, just do it. Mm -hmm. um, worst case, you don't like it, you quit. Um, I definitely have not quit jobs nearly as soon as I should have in the past. Um, but just, just do it and try it and see, um, see if you like it. And if you don't, um, do something else. What do you think, what are you hoping that it, it being this consulting that you're going to start doing on product management? I'd like to hear a little bit more about what, yeah. what that looks like. What are you hoping that that fills for you? Like what, 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 what gap or, or what? what aspect of your bucket are you hoping gets addressed by, by that? Like I, I, it comes to that like problem solving thing. Like I like solving, mm. I, you know, if you look back on the career, like one thing that's been unique compared to other folks I know is I've worked in a ton of different technologies and industries. Like there isn't a common thread. So when I go to apply for jobs, if they're looking for an expert in foo, um, well, I've done foo and bar and bad and like I've done all these different things. And so I think it's, you know, learning new technologies, learning new spaces. That's fun. Um, solving organizational or strategy problems is fun. And so I think it's it's working that part of of my brain that, uh, you know, both the triathlons and the reading and the other stuff aren't um, aren't kind of working that problem solving people uh aspect of it uh and so i think you know i'm still figuring out exactly what it's going to look like long term the the first company i'm working with you know really wants to look at improving their processes how they do product management working with the the people that they have on the team um so that sounds fun because it checks a lot of the boxes um maybe they'll need help with product strategy we'll see um so you know seeing if that that is fun and interesting, but it, it's sort of the, can I do the things I like about product management, which is figuring out customer market for it, um, building teams, um, you know, figuring out, you know, how do we prioritize the right features and capabilities, but in like a bite size portion, um, that seems like it could be uh, fun and we'll see and kind of iterate uh, from there, kind of do some agile development on my, my career. It sounds like a ton of fun. Uh, what for people that might be facing a similar situation? One of the most daunting things is like, okay, well, you've got this skill and you know you can help people, but how do you find anyone interested in hiring you for that? Um, that it doesn't want a full time employee or doesn't want uh, or that's willing to pay you. And like, how, how do you how do you find somebody to to consult with? Well, I got lucky; they found me. Um, mm or maybe not lucky. So I, I I think to your question earlier too about why did I, not why did I help, but why do I, I you never know who in your network is gonna be interesting. And so, you know, the, the folks who've reached out, there's another person I talked to who might be interested as well. Um, they're all people who I've worked with someone they know. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's sort of the reputation I've built, the relationships I've fostered, um, those folks know what I'm capable of, what I've been able to do. And so, you know, I, I found almost every job that I've gotten and every opportunity that I have, it's through someone, not necessarily someone I know directly, but someone they know. Uh, you know, I got the job at DocuSign because a guy who had worked for me at Joyant um, knew uh, like invited me to a mixer there. And I met a couple of the guys who were on the product team. We hit it off. It was great. You know, I, I ended up at Adobe because I had met Kevin Lynch at a, 
browser conference um, where I was the only person from Microsoft there. So I got on stage with like Brendan Ike and all these guys and um, happened to be chatting with with Kevin afterwards. And, you know, it, it ended up there was a roller opportunity um, on his team. You know, all the jobs I got within Microsoft were friends of a friend. You know, the the guy I worked with in Xbox, you know, my husband had worked for a guy on his team way back in the day. Mm. And so it's sort of like the, the relationships I've I've cultivated and fostered over time just pop up in um, interesting and in, in, in different ways. So I, you know, I think building and maintaining your network, even if it's just catching up with people you haven't talked to um, in ages and hearing how they're doing um, can lead to unexpected uh, opportunities. And then it's your reputation and your past work that is kind of your calling card for for those opportunities. Yeah, I think people get networking wrong. Uh, a lot of times they think it's going out and, you know, pressing the flesh and shaking hands and all that kind of stuff. But good networking is actually just doing your job well and treating people like making impressions on people in moments that matter, not in, you know, mixers, uh, you know, well, <laughs> it, it, it's like you and I, it, we, we didn't spend hours and hours and hours working together, but no. it's like, you know, you made an impression on me. So when you reached out and, and said, Hey, I, you know, I could use some help. I'm like, sure. Why not? Um, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's treating people, you know, the way that you'd want to be treated and doing good work. And it kind of comes back, you know, it doesn't mean you're not going to have bad experiences along the way. Like I've had some really poor experiences and people who I will never work with mm -hmm. again. Th those mm -hmm. are the people who do not get the, the messages back. You know, I had a recruiter ask about someone who's someone who I'd never uh, work with again. And I'm like, I don't think I have anything to say there. Um, so, so there are people who make really strong impressions, I think, uh, both directions. But yeah, I, you know, finding opportunities to say yes to interesting conversations. I don't think I've ever felt those wasteful because you, you also learn interesting things when you talk to people about their experiences, which I think mm -hmm. enriches um, your own uh, life as well. Laurel, last question I had for you. Yeah. Um, do you think at all about what it will, when you look back on it, will be have been a life well spent? Like, do you evaluate what you're going to do going forward based off of, at all about what you think you might evaluate looking backwards um, toward the end of your career or life? And if so, what are what are the ways that you kind of are going to grade yourself about whether you've you've made choices professionally that that you're you're proud of and happy with. Well, I think in in the micro moments, I try to make sure I feel good about all the the decisions I made. I mean, I think in particular, like when my dad was really sick, um, I you know, made the decision to work part time once once he entered hospice and what that looked like. And I just remember the day before he passed, I was working from his house in his living room and um, I was on the call with some by having actually like a mentoring conversation with someone and my dad needed something. And I was like, I just I have to go. Um, and it's the fact that I feel like in all of those little moments, I made the decision I can live with partly because I learned, you know, my husband had had gotten hurt um, many years ago and he hurt his elbow and was at home and I spent more time at work and less time helping him. And I did not feel good about that. And so taking that lesson and realizing, you know, when I have the other opportunities, let me pick the choice that I I feel good about long term. Like there there may have been things I could have done differently at Microsoft or other ports of my career that means I could still be there, but they're not necessarily the decisions that I want to to live with. So I think it's in all of those do I feel like I made the choice that I feel good about. And then if I look at the grand scheme of things, um you know, part of the reason I I want to still work is I still think that there's opportunities for me to have impact and how can I take the talent and skills that I have and do it 
but for me right now the most important thing is how do i balance that with um prioritizing myself and my health too which is not the choice that i've always made so i i guess it's partly how do i look back on the past decisions i've made and use that to make um better decisions in in the future uh and try not to beat myself up or regret too much of the past because you can't uh change it but but i'd like to think the legacy is you know who are the people i've impacted um some of it's like what are the products i've built um and then i think you and i maybe talked about this before we chatted like how can the role model that i've been uh impact other people to make decisions that are happier and healthier uh for them as well i i lied because your question your answer made me think of one more <laughs> thing so, so a lot of your answer spoke to me on a, on a work-life balance point of view yeah. choosing moments to prioritize your family your health you know other pieces um one could interpret that as well so you, you have some flexibility you don't have to go back to work so why don't you just prioritize all those things and not do work at all but you're not choosing that path at least it seems like yeah. you're not why not why not just always choose um those other things well i think part of it is i a, a smart i met with a smart friend uh a couple weeks ago who who he believes there's kind of three important legs to your life the health the emotional and the like intellectual and i think he's on to something with the fact that you kind of need a balance of all three and it doesn't necessarily need to be from work per se i think you know, but it's it's making sure you're doing the right things to take care of your health, um, partly because it makes enjoying life easier, but also longer life and all those things. You know, having the relationships with friends and family. Um, but f for me, I think if they're at least for me, the the you need some sort of intellectual um, stimulation. You know, something to keep you engaged and, but but it's finding the the balance of the three like having none was making me feel angsty because for me like contributing to the world helping people like that's part of my values and important and i was getting a little bit of it mentoring people but not enough and so it's okay let me try to turn turn the dial up you know i, I am really privileged because i get to um set my dials in a way that's sustainable uh and i don't think a lot of people are like it's it's really hard to hold down a full-time job and keep those dials in any sort of of um balance but i just know that i need something um you know at least appetizer sized uh to to feel kind of fulfilled and and engaged laurel reitman thank you so much for spending the time with us today uh, it's been great to to catch up I could talk to you for another few hours easily. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we will talk again yeah. soon and wish you all the luck in you. your new endeavors and in your, your half marathon goals. Uh, yeah. If somebody is interested in reaching out to you uh, for consulting or other reasons, where should they find you? The best place is on LinkedIn, uh, www, you know, LinkedIn slash Laurel Reitman. That's probably the easiest way to, to find me and get a hold of me. Awesome. Laura Reitman, everybody, uh, appreciate you uh, listening to another episode of Work Dad Podcast. If you haven't already, click the subscribe and like button and click the bell to get notified when we have a new episode come out. So see you all soon. Another episode incoming. Until then, this is Brian Nemhauser. Have a good rest of your day.